of Stuart Models Beam Engine Rebuild, Part 23, refitting the top cylinder cover and assembling the eccentric rod. I have a couple of these. These are Microcosm Engines Governors, and I'm seriously thinking about the possibility of mounting one of these governors on this engine. I think the first one is the better looking type, but maybe I should fit this one, I don't know. One of the things I have to do in this episode is sort out this eccentric strap. Using a small centre drill to make a hole in the strap and then drilling it from the inside, I've made an oil way to lubricate the sheave. Then after bolting the eccentric strap to the eccentric rod, I refitted it to the eccentric sheave on the crankshaft. At the other end, this is a temporary fixing. It's just a bolt to hold the fork end of the eccentric rod in position on the valve gear driving mechanism. And now when I rotate the flywheel, not only does the piston go up and down, the slide valve that you can't see inside the valve chest is moving up and down also. Now it's time to make a gasket for the top cylinder cover. I'm using the ink pad method. Simply press the part onto an ink pad and then transfer the image onto the gasket. Then smudge the ink on the gasket paper and repeat the process. And yes, we all make mistakes from time to time, said the hedgehog as it climbed off the hairbrush. I cut out the black mark on the gasket paper using a pair of scissors and then cleaned it up with a small drum sander in my Proxon motor tool. Then I fitted the hole in the gasket paper onto the register underneath the top cylinder cover and trimmed the outside edge using a pair of scissors once again. Alternatively, I could have left the gasket oversized, fitted it to the cylinder and then trimmed it away with a craft knife. But this seems to be a better way of doing it. Once it's done, it's done. No chance of the craft knife slipping and marking the cylinder, or even worse, the cylinder cladding. The next part of the job involves removing every one of the studs. These are not really studs, they're just pieces of threaded rod. I'm taking out these pieces of studding for two reasons. One reason being to allow me to clean up the face of the cylinder, scraping off what was left of the old gasket material. This is important to avoid any potential leaks when you fit the new gasket. The other reason is so I can convert these pieces of studding and the nuts into small homemade bolts. At this stage, I drill all the holes in the gasket material using the cylinder cover as a template. I poured some cellulose thinners or lacquer thinner into this old aerosol cap, and I'm putting all the six nuts and the six pieces of studding in there. The reason for this is to degrease the parts, and once I've stirred them up with a paintbrush, this should completely remove any oil from the studs as well as the nuts, and this will allow me to use some Loctite 603 and permanently fix the nuts on more or less exactly the same point on every one of the studs. To make it easy, I just tipped a small amount of Loctite 603 onto the bench, and now every one of these studs has a small 7BA nut permanently bonded to it. So a nut stuck to a stud becomes a bolt. And once the Loctite 603 had fully cured, I used these to secure the cylinder cover to the cylinder. This is what it looks like at the top of the piston rod. The lock nut holds the piston rod fitting firmly in place. Time to see if everything works. I've temporarily connected an airline. In this clip I'm putting some oil in the airline fitting. This oil will be used to lubricate the slide valve in the steam chest and the cylinder. All I need to do now is look in my box of small grub screws and find a suitable grub screw to fit this. And after moving the position of the eccentric sheave and tightening the grub screw to hold that to the crankshaft, it's time to turn on the air and see what happens. It must be beginner's luck, the engine starts to run. Although the valve events are not correct, and what will follow will be the usual obsessive moving of the eccentric sheave until I get it just right. I think that's a little bit too advanced. Time to give it some oil anyway. I don't want to run the engine with dry bearings. So on every moving part, it's getting a bit of oil. This is not steam oil, it's lubricating oil. It's not quite as thick as steam oil. These days, I buy my lubricating oil and steam oil from a company called Hallett's Oils. It's really good quality stuff and their website address is on screen at the moment. Time now to let in some compressed air.
and that's really not bad. It still needs a bit of tweaking to get the timing to perfection, which don't forget is just before top and bottom dead center. The timing's nearly right, I just need to do this. One final minute tweak to the position of the slide valve linkage. Why do we use a hammer? Well, because I do. The tap with the hammer just aligns everything. Now I can finally tighten up the linkages. There's a skill and a bit of art in this. It's knowing where to hit the engine and how hard to hit the engine with the small hammer. Also, the size of the hammer is fairly important. This one is a good size. And this one is far too big. Do not use a hammer of this size, whatever you do. The engine's running okay, really, to say it was in such a mess when I got it. The watts paddle and motion need some attention. But even now, the engine is running very well, with quite a high pressure, and my hand on the flywheel, there's plenty of power. There's still a bit of a problem with the valve operating lever it's rocking about. That's because the two links at the bottom are not perfectly level with each other. But a slight adjustment to the links at the bottom of the valve rods puts this right. Both of the links need to be in exactly the same position. If one's higher than the other, the valve operating levers will move around. The engine's got a bit of a knock about it, but I've heard a lot worse than this. There's a bit of play on the pins where they go through the beam and the watts parallel motion is not fitted correctly. This is due once again to the fact that the pins are not right that go through the motion. I'll sort this out in the next episode and then see if the engine runs any better. But that's it really, I can't say any more. The engine's running and it didn't originally and was incomplete, so I'm fairly pleased with it so far. I will end this episode by just saying, as usual, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website. Click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you will find it very easy to find other videos that you may like to watch.